Um, so I'm with uh, Anne and Linda. Thank you very much for your time. So yeah. explain me why you started 23andMe. Yeah, we started 23andMe because we really wanted to make a difference in healthcare and we wanted to, to create a whole new avenue for research. Um, we also really wanted to empower individuals to get access to their own genetic information. So we think we can really transform healthcare by empowering individuals to get their own information and using it as part of a community. All right. So when when I so you need to speak in a in a tube. Yeah. What happens? I mean, how does it, you know, I've just done it, so it takes two minutes. Right. But what happens next? Do you take it and what do you do with, with well, it? Well, normally uh, we send you a kit in the mail. This is unusual at, at the forum that we hand it to you directly, but you get the kit in the mail, you spit in it, and then you put it in an envelope and it gets sent to our lab where we do the processing. And that's where we take the DNA out of the saliva and we put it into a process where it reads about 600,000 points in your genome. So then we throw the, you know, whatever leftover saliva out, we throw the DNA away because now we have your digital profile right we email you a password or a notification that your data is ready and then you log in with the username and password that you set up on your account and then you start using all of the tools that we've developed to help you understand your genetic information so what, what do I get and can you yeah. explain me yeah. then so four weeks after what, four what information do four I get? weeks later like Linda says you get the email and then there's really three different areas you can explore you can start to explore your ancestry so your maternal lineage where your mother mother's 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 mother has come from so you can start looking at that you can then do a global similarity comparison to see how similar your genotype is to various populations around the world and then we have another feature called gene journal which really is comparing your DNA to all the literature that's coming out so billions of dollars a year spent on research what does that mean for you and the third area really is the sharing component which actually is one of our most popular features where you might want to share with someone and see do you have the same haplogroup do you, how similar are you in your broccoli tasting? You know, do you really like the same kind of bitter vegetables? So there's a lot of fun sharing features that you can do, and you can start to see, you know, potentially we're, potentially we're distant cousins. Maybe we're, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh cousins. So there's some of those fun things that you start to be able to do. Do you foresee any uh, social software out of that? Like, you know, I share my, uh, my DNA information, and you tell me who I should meet in your database. Like, if, if I'm like this, you know, I'm likely to like you. Well, you know, the, the science behind all of that is still really uncertain, but the social networking part, absolutely, where you might be able to share just a snippet of your genetic information and make it available for other people to search it to see if they match you in certain ways. So we'll have a lot of different layers of ways that you will be able to go and search and find other people who are either related to you or compatible in some way genetically. And then but we... So wait, 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 stop. Yeah. What is it to be compatible with, with someone genetically? Can you tell me if I, if I would love someone? from my oh, DNA? I, I highly doubt that. There's a lot more that goes into that than just your genetics. So I think we'll learn a lot more, though, about how people interact. And, and I think it's just an interesting way for people to connect with each other. And there could be very um, important ways that people could connect. We, we can tell when you have your immune system. We know your immune system from your genetics. And we could find other people who are compatible with you immune system-wise. And whether or not that becomes a way for us to find someone in your system if you need you know, if people are looking for a bone marrow transplant or something like that, you know, that's that's the hope is that we'll actually, beyond just doing some fun dating things, we want to do something that's hopefully useful for healthcare. Well, fun, you know, like Match.com and meeting the dating site in Europe, they are huge, right? So it could be a... Yeah, I think one of the areas that's going to be big potentially, and this will happen eventually, is you'll be able to find lost cousins. So if you want there's a huge migration out of Europe after World War II. If you want to find lost relatives, third, fourth cousins, that's something that potentially you could do through 23andMe. Tell me about privacy, because I blogged about it a little bit, and uh, that's the first pe uh, question people ask. is where, where is the data going? What are you doing with it? So we've built a lot of, of components into our system that will protect your privacy. And we really use the online banking community, or, um, technology as a basis for what we're doing because we, we think that we can learn a lot from that because it's probably it's probably worse for you to, for someone to get into your bank account than to get your genetic information because you know. If they well, imagine my insurance company. Account. Like I find out, I, I just spat right. So and you have a box or you have a terms of service saying you may actually learn things like you don't expect, right? or it could be bad news you have a sentence like this so I don't want my insurance company to know that right yeah so, so you won't tell them so we um, 
we feel very strongly security and privacy is incredibly important and your information is controlled by you. So you sign up, it's only used by you. We actually keep those databases separate so all of your identifying information like your name, your email, your address is kept separate from your genetic information. So um, you know, even there's something called chain of custody where we would not, if you ordered a kit, we can't necessarily guarantee that that was you that spat. It might have been your wife, it might have been your child, it might have been your neighbor. So we actually cannot guarantee. So there's a lot of things that we've done to make sure that that genetic information doesn't necessarily go back to you. That said, we have, um, you know, it's still, it's a gray area and we're hoping that legislation will come yeah. that makes it very clear that there should not be genetic discrimination. And in Davos, you've given away a thousand uh, tests, right? I took yeah. one. So from these thousand, you know, people going to Davos are a little different. Yeah. Are you going to build like a perfect human clone of that information? Oh, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> Luckily, we don't have the technology to do that. So it's, it's an incredible group of people here, and we're really hoping that we can continue to build a relationship with them. And next year, we'll see what comes from this. But, but do you think, you see my point is, do you think there is a DNA for people succeeding in politics, in business? And are you comparing, you know, Larry's or Sergey's yeah, DNA yeah. with... Uh, Shimon Perez DNA. Yeah. We were talking about that earlier. That would be if they all want to share, they definitely can. It's up to them. It's up to them. You know, I think that's what's going to happen. Is you're going to get lots of different variations. Linda and I have actually almost maxed out our sharing. We're each sharing with about 40 people. I think Sergey is just behind us, sharing with about 30 or so. So sharing is definitely popular. People want to find interesting things. You know, I think there might be. You know, one day could you find? You know, why? You know, I don't really like food. I I I can't really tell the difference between red wine, white wine, and pink wine when I mix the two. So why? <laughs> why? Why is that? So you know, versus. <laughs> so I apologize in front of you. No, 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 just, it's okay. So I realize, like, I'm just, you know, that's just. I've always been that way. So is there a gene associated with why I'm not? I'm kind of food agnostic. So maybe, you know, versus someone like Alice Waters, who's just an amazing chef, we had dinner with her the other night, you know, who clearly has an incredibly refined palate. So, you know, could you start to, you know, could you start to understand those things? Maybe it's because I don't, maybe I'm missing some genes that don't allow me to taste certain kinds of foods. So we're, we're on the fun, uh, fun part now, the, the more scary part, which I am probably mistaken in, but is there like a gene, sorry for asking stupid question, for, so, so like, like a, a DNA or gene for cancer that will, you know, show me that I'm like specifically subject to like a very bad disease. There is, I guess, right, something like that. Well, when I learned that from spitting in your uh, 23 Me tube, well, what do I do? Yeah, well, you learn it. What I think people are finding out that, and we're talking to our customers as they get their data, that they're finding out that it's not it's not definitive at, at all. And what we're reflecting back to them is what's coming out of the research community. So it's, it's all very preliminary. And plus, if you have one gene, there might be 19 other genes that we haven't even discovered yet. So how much influence that one gene has on whether or not you get cancer is really small. So it's, it's a cumulative effect, plus your environment, your exposure to certain things also impacts that greatly. So yeah. genetics is not going to be the one deciding factor. No, I understand, but you see my point is more about finding something really scary. Yeah. It will happen, right? I guess you plan yeah. that. Yeah. What do you do? You know, you tell the guy, you know, now you have to see a doctor immediately. And so, you know, there's nothing on it that's going to be so scary. Again, this is like Linda says, it's all probability. And even Linda was on a panel with Francis Collins earlier today, and he was referring, you know, talking about how cholesterol test is something that's out there that, you know, people realize that's that's a data point that, that doesn't tell you deterministically that you're going to have heart disease, but it's a it's it's one factor, and I think this is very similar to that. This could be one factor that says you know you might be at slightly higher risk. You know, you might be slightly higher risk for type two diabetes, but if you eat well and you're and you're you maintain good body weight and you exercise, you know, you've done other things to lower it. So you really have to look at the complete picture. And one of the things 23andMe really wants to help advance is understanding better how to use this information in a clinical setting. Right now, there have not been a lot of translational studies where people understand how to use this information just yet. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. All right, good. Yeah, we can't wait to get your data. Well, I can't wait to hear your yeah, confirmation. Yeah. I'll share it. Yeah, good, good, good. good. Thank you. Love a big party.